Good morning. You know, uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to take you through a, a discussion today of you know where we're at currently with the uh, use of lasers, uh, particularly tissue sparing laser treatments in the era of anti-VEGF. And I, I hope to convince you that you know there is a, still a very important role. Uh, you know, not only as an adjunct to anti-VEGFs, but potentially as a primary treatment for many macular diseases with, with the laser. Okay. Um, you know, the, some of the take home messages that I, I hope to get across to you is that a variety of macular diseases can effectively be treated with lasers in the anti-VEGF era. New scientific evidence to support endpoint management has really encouraged my increased utilization of these, these uh, lasers. And for the first time, we've developed parameters that can be studied throughout uh, national and international trials. Uh, one of the problems that we've had in the past with these uh, sub-threshold non-burning lasers is that you know, there wasn't a standardized way of determining parameters. And, and I'll show you, we've, ha we've had a nice meeting, nice consensus to, to help us with that. And of course, current protocols will continue to elucidate which conditions are going to respond best to this, to this uh, treatment. Now, I trained in Boston. So I was there at the time we were developing the anti-VEGF. So, you know, the anti-VEGFs are very dear to my heart. And I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Judah Folkman. And, and when I first saw the results of the anti-VEGFs, I, I thought we cured it all. But soon enough, we found out that, in fact, we did not. No doubt that the anti-VEGFs have had a very important impact on blindness and, and macular disease. But in diabetes, which is, tends to plague most of the world and is going to continue to plague us, uh, the anti-VEGFs on, only give us a clinically significant response in less than 50% of the patients. So 50% of the patients are not being treated. And of course, the, the disease is much more complex than just that VEGF. But you know, I had a lot of my colleagues. I'm part of DRCR Net here in the US. And some of my colleagues have stood up and said, well, you know what, I, there's no need for a laser now. And I disagree, and I'll show you why right now. Our own clinical trials you know, really work, up, uh, work against us. So again, there's no doubt that the old laser, the old laser and, and you know, the standard thermal laser compared to the use of the drugs is inferior. There's no doubt. I think we all agree with that. There's no doubt the, the anti-VEGF drugs in combination or uh, on their own early or delayed laser uh, works well. I think that we've all agreed to that. Now, the problem is, as I just pointed out, I, and I published this paper about uh, two years ago in ophthalmology, you keep treating these patients, okay, and you get different responses, right? You get, you get some that have this great response, like on the blue line, you get the intermediate, and then you, you get those patients where you treat them for a, fir a full year, and it's not working. So what happens when you follow them up for three years? Same thing. So you can predict basically after three injections, pretty much if you stratify the patients on visual acuity, and that's what we did here, if they gain less than five, five to nine, and greater than 10, you can predict after three injections more or less how these patients are gonna do at year one, two, and three. So after three injections, if you're still having a limited response in terms of improvement, you know, you need to start considering other treatments. What that other treatments are, there are protocols currently evaluating, but the, the, your options in your armamentarium include, of course, lasers, steroids, you know, and if you use protocol T, if you did not, if you did not use a flibercept as your first line and the visual acuity is worse than 2050, then you may want to consider three injections with a flibercept. But if if the visual acuity is 2040 or better, as you recall, it doesn't matter which one of the agents you use, okay? You need to consider moving forward. So I think this is important. So now, why do I tell you that you need a laser? Well, the, the clinical trials themselves will show you that. For example, this is protocol I, okay? Remember, we use laser either immediate or delayed, and we follow these patients out and got these great visual outcomes. But now, 
the question is, what percentage of these patients required laser treatment? Well, in, in this one, everybody used, required laser, correct? But how about in this group? What, what happened to that group? What percentage of those patients where you had an option to give laser later, after six months, required laser? And as you can see, in the, even in the deferred laser group, about 20 to about 20 plus percent of those patients still required some laser to achieve those visual outcomes. Okay, it gets worse. It gets worse. Here we are. All of you guys love protocol T. Great visual outcomes comparing the three different drugs that are currently used. How did we get these outcomes at year one and year two? What was the need for laser in that group? Well, here it is. If you use a Bevacizumab, 64% of those patients required laser in two years versus 52 in the ranibizumab, and then the powerhouse, supposedly, 41% of those patients still required laser. So, in fact, in order for you to simulate those trial results, you need to be lasering these patients. Otherwise, you're, you're under treating them, and you're not following protocol T. Now, when I say laser, I don't mean this. This should be historical archives because we are beginning to learn that this is not what gave us the benefit. And I think there's new clinical and scientific evidence that basically has helped direct my mind and change my mind. And I had the opportunity to work with Daniel Pelinker out of Stanford, and I believe he is the world's expert on the interaction between laser and tissues. And what I'm gonna present right now is a work out of his laboratory. Now, there's different concepts that we have to understand, okay? There's a difference between sub-threshold laser and laser that does not cause tissue damage. Just because you don't see it ophthalmoscopically does not mean that it's not there, okay? And I, I hope to show you evidence that shows that it's actually not the damaged tissue that's causing the benefit when we apply laser. It's actually the response around it. And, and he's got beautiful evidence that at least helped me make, change my mind on, on, on these lasers. Now, you know, one of the arguments that, that, that we have is, you know, I start this discussion and, and they say, well, you know what, sub-threshold uh, laser uh, micropulse works. There's no arguing that micropulse works. I'm not here to tell you it doesn't. My question to you is, does it work without causing injury? Right? Because these diabetics are going to keep coming back to you and they're going to require treatment. My, the point to you is, do you do you want response with injury, potentially, or do you want a response and spare the tissue? And I think the answer is obvious, you know. This is the only equation I'm gonna show you, but this is, very, this, this is a very important slide for you to understand. I mean, this, is, uh, this shows the Arrhenius integral, and what this shows is the interaction between laser energy and tissue. So when you, when you for example, begin to, to uh, apply laser on your, your tissue and you're titrating your energy, okay? If you titrate your energy and you see a, and you see a barely visible burn, that's 100% here, okay? Obviously, you're seeing it because there's been injury to the tissue and that's why you wanna do that away from any important structures. If you see, if you look at how you can vary the effects and keep yourself in the therapeutic range, which is this range here, it's very difficult. You have to manipulate pulse energy and your pulse duration. And by doing this, the new system in the laser has a, an algorithm that allows you to do this without you having to worry about how to manipulate the, 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 uh, the settings. And I'll show you how that works because you want to be in this range. So what we have found is that the endpoint management energy, once you've titrated to a barely, barely visible lesion, you want to set it at 30% and you want your, your treatment pulse to be somewhere between 
10 and 15, because that puts you in this range here. Okay? And, uh, and if you try and do that manually, it, 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 it's impossible. You need to have that integral to, it, to that automated system to be able to do that for you. Now, why is that important? Well, you know, there's something about elevating the temperature in the tissue, target tissue, that activates a reparative mechanism. And one of the things that we can measure is uh, heat shock protein, okay? I'm not telling you that heat shock protein is the only, you know, the only cytokine, chemokine factor that gets activated. That's the one that we can easily measure and it's been correlated with what we see. But I guarantee you that there's more complex systems than that. And we're doing some studies right now to, to measure and try and measure those levels in the vitreous levels of the patients. As you can see, as you increase the endpoint management energy, anything above 40, you start noticing some damage to the RPE. That's why we shoot for 30%, 30 to 35, and that gives you a nice response that you know, gives us the clinical benefit that we've been able to notice. Now, here's a barely visible burn to see what happens to the tissue. Not surprisingly, the red means you've killed, you've destroyed, right? The viable tissue is, is the green. So a barely visible burn gives you a, an important damage to the tissue. Look at, how, look at the areas that, were, that produce, that upregulate heat shock protein. Is it the middle where the tissue is dead or is it the edges, the edges? And that's why it's important. If your treatment is trying to elevate heat shock protein, then you don't want to be destroying the tissue that produces it, right? Now, here's the opposite. Look at 100%, only the edge stands for heat shock protein. Look at what happens when you lower it to 30%. A lot more heat shock protein is produced in all the tissue. So, you know, the concept with the lasers now is no longer the old, I'm going to cause a burn to cause an effect. It's more, I'm going to heat the protein, the tissues, to activate the reparative mechanisms. And that's, how, and that's the difference that we need to, to think. Now, before we had this consensus meeting, if I took 10 retina specialists and asked them how they titrate, they'd give you 10 different answers, okay? That's one side of the story. The second side of the story is some guys will, would say, well, you know what, I just use one energy for everybody. And I see people from different countries here. Look, my Scandinavian descendant patient from Wisconsin is going to need is going to need a different energy to create a laser burn than my African American patient than my Latin American patient. Why? Because of the pigmentation. I think we all agree with that. So that's why, to me, when someone tells me, you know, use the same energy for every patient then you know then i am not really being scientific about it number one and and I'm, I'm not concerned of whether or not i'm causing injury because that's a good way for us to to get into the areas we don't want to be so what we do is we we titrate at six o'clock right below the arcade and we slowly increase the energy until we see barely, a barely visible burn at three seconds you know we range the power it doesn't matter which wavelength, because remember, the system comes in 532 and 577. I happen to have 577, but it doesn't matter which of the wavelengths you use. The exposure interval is 15. The, you use a 200 micron spot size, and you start with a quarter spot size separation. When we retreat, and I'll, I'll review that, I go down to zero. And even if you have 0% it's zero spacing, you're only treating about 79, 80% of the tissue, so it's not like you're treating everything. And again, as long as you follow these parameters, it doesn't really matter because you're not damaging the tissue, okay? Endpoint management, 30%. The machine now, when you, it, 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 and you should go see it, it, you know, it has a non, it, it has an EPM mode and it takes you there. The only variable is your energy. So it automatically gets you there. Okay, now retreatment, and this is so important. Retreatment is just like treat with an anti-VEGF. 
That's why the mentality needs to change. Remember, you're trying to elevate the concentration of the heat shock protein. So the way you do that is by increasing your, your, your area of treatment. And you do that by decreasing the spacing between the spots. Okay? And sometimes, you know, I'll do an extra ring around even the... No, quite often, I'll do the, the pattern, and then I'll do some more rings around it. And I'll tell you, I've, I've treated many patients now, have done serial baseline autofluorescence and delayed, and there's no change. When I was using the micropulse, I, I did see a little spickling, which implies there's been an alteration in the tissues. Okay? And like anything else, you know, not everybody is going to give you the response. But that's why you have multiple options in your armamentarium. Okay? These are some of the conditions that are currently being evaluated for uh, the use of this technology. Central serous, DME, vein occlusions, and, and, and some interesting work out of South America and Brazil on MACTEL. Because one of the, one of the areas where, that gets activated are the Mueller cells in this, in, in this condition. And, and if you recall the recent publications, Mueller cell dysfunction seems to be an important part of MacTown. So, studies underway, you know, that data should be interesting. Now, how do I treat DME? Well, I still, if you saw the latest uh, survey from, the, uh, from ASRS, I'm one of those guys. I still will use anti-VEGES at first line if it's center-involved DME. If it's center-involved DME. If I have non-center-involved DME that, that still meets the old ETDRS criteria, I'll go straight to the laser. Why? Because I have no data to help me with the anti-VEGFs. There's some protocols being evaluated. And I know from my old, my old, uh, the, the old ETDRS data, that works. And it helps protect the patient. So if I'm going to cause an injury, you know, I'm going to try it. So then I continue for three injections, and then I use that, that paper that I told you. I stratify them based on visual acuity. Uh, if, the, if the visual acuity is 20-20 and the macula is normal, then I'll continue a treat and extend type of paradigm. If it's center involved, I continue treating them. If, it's, if the visual acuity, as I told you, is worse than 2050 and I did not start with a flibercept, I'll give them three injections of flibercept. If I started with a flibercept, uh, and, and they're still there. If I saw a response, I might continue for another three, but my limit is three to six. Once I don't see a nice response with three to six, I'm thinking I need to do something else. If they haven't responded after three, even though I've used the Flibercept, then again, quickly, I'll start looking at either a steroid or introducing a laser or a combination. You know, if you don't feel comfortable taking them off the anti-VEGF, combine it. It does, you know, you won't lose anything, okay? So that's how we, we, we treat them. Now, this is, this is courtesy of, of uh, Dr. Levinsky from, uh, in Brazil. Um, you know, I want to just show you a case of what you can do. This is a, a patient with obviously, you know, center-involved DME, uh, significant uh, macular edema. Visual acuity had dropped to 2060, and then, you know, so he did the right thing, and he submitted her to do an intravitreal injection. And like many patients, they don't like it. And I have, a, I have a few subset of them I have to take to the surgical center and give them a little sedative for them to allow me to give the injection. But now that I have the laser, I, I, I have a, a good option. So the patient received one ranibizumab. And then I want to show you this case because, you know, unlike the anti-VEGFs, it's not, you, you're not necessarily going to get that wow effect in, the, in two weeks or three weeks. You know, you need to be patient and, and treat these patients. You can see over a period of, you know, almost eight to ten months, he did repeated treatments. And as the macula improved slowly, so did the visual acuity. And that's a very important message, you know, that it's unlike the anti-VEGFs, your response may be a little bit slower. And you need to be patient, you know, as you treat these patients. The, the beauty of it is that, you know, at, at this point, we're retreating them every three months. You know, can we do it sooner than three months? Well, again, you know, those are studies that we're going to have to, you know, complete and design and, and, uh, 
and evaluate. But uh, again, this this is an important message. So, to s to summarize, you know, a variety of macular diseases can effectively be treated with lasers in the anti-VEGF era. There's scientific evidence that it is mounting that the effects of the laser in the past was not the thermal injury, but the the elevation in, in temperature that activates these uh, reparative mechanisms in these in these diabetics and non-diabetics, right? Because central serous responds to this, you know, in, in the studies that have been published, and there are a few others. And I think you know there'll be some uh, good answers with when we complete some of the current protocols in in progress. So. I, I, I wanted to leave some time uh, for questions because I think it's it, it's important for us to have some of that that interaction. Um, any questions? The the question the question is uh, you know are there any controlled studies yet between thermal laser and these lasers? You know the answer is no, and there never will be because the standard of care right now is going to be are going to be the anti vegfs so so any any protocols are going to probably uh, involve either uh, one anti vegf with a, re a a very clear rescue therapy for them uh, versus you know the the anti vegf you understand so mo you know the fda right now really is is not going to allow us to do to do a, a laser study as first line, when, and center involved, and center involved. Forty. No, exactly. No, I agree. It's a big number. You know, I'm part of the DRCR net, and we've talked about that. You know, and, and but I'll tell you right now, that you're going to have a couple of challenges if you try to do a study where lasers first line versus, yeah. I think, I, I think, you know, although it may be good as first line, but from, a, from an IRB ethical standpoint, the FDA, they're not gonna allow us to do it. What they will, what they will do is they'll, let, they'll allow you to do an anti-VEGF, then add the laser with a very strict rescue criteria. That they will do. But the old model, you know, although it may work, I mean, no. What people do in clinical practice after is something that, you know, as you know, a lot of the studies are, are designed to get regulatory approval. You know, we actually learn how to use the drugs once they're approved <laughs> because, you know, I don't think any of us use these drugs exactly the way we did in the clinical trial. That's a guide. You have to individualize the treatment for every patient, obviously. The question is my experience related to CSR. You know, obviously, this is my personal experience. This is not anything that uh, TopCon or anybody has done. I, that's my first-line treatment now, okay? Uh, I have had very good response. Um, I don't wait the four months anymore, you know, because as uh, the more OCTs I've done on, on patients who have had CSR in, in the past, the more I'm concerned. One of the most common causes of non-specific retinal atrophy on your OCTs is previous CSR that was undiagnosed. So what I do, and remember, a lot of these patients, you know, even though even it resolves and you know, they're 2020, and you're telling them, oh, you know, it's great, you're 2020, but they're telling you, doc, but it's not the same. Something happens as we allow that to be chronic, and I and I treat them, and I'll tell you, I I believe in the therapy. We're getting our, our numbers together so we can present them. You know, you can see a response after, after applying the, the non-thermal laser on them within seven days. You can have almost 90% resolution of the, and you know that doesn't happen with anything else that we do. So, again, there's some great studies. Dr. Levinsky and others down in Brazil have, have done some uh, 20 eyes or so, and they've, I don't think they've published them yet, but they've, they've uh, given a, uh, some presentations, and what they found, not only was there faster resolution, you know, the recurrence rate, and they followed these patients out two years, the recurrence rate dramatically dropped for them, which is obviously very important. You were going to ask them.
the question is, what if there's no response after uh, EP, EPM uh, CSR? You know, how quickly can you retreat? I'll tell you, I haven't seen many patients that don't respond. So, you know, what you do is you treat, you use your FA, you treat the areas that light up, and then I do, even in areas that, I, that do not have the fluorescence, again, that's my personal, okay, I treat. For the reasons that I told you, I'm trying to elevate the, the factors, heat shock protein, X, Y, and Z that we haven't identified yet. So my objective is to make sure that I have enough tissue activated to give me that response. I, I haven't had to retreat them. I retreat them every three months. You know, I do see a response. Now, some of them may not resolve completely, so then I just redo it in, after three months. Now, this type of laser. That have traction? Uh, the, the question is, do I have any experience in patients with uh, PDR and tractional? No. No, because if, if, I, if I see that there's enough of a concern with traction and it's not responding to the anti-VEGF or a steroid, you know, then to me that's a surgical indication. Now, I haven't tried it. I don't think you'll, you'll cause a problem if you try it. I, I mean, I just don't have experience with it. It was it was on the three month, uh, you know, it, it was uh, it's called the early analysis, and and uh, 2016 uh, AJO uh, November, and it's uh, and and it's just showing how to stratify and evaluate the patients so that you know that after three months how they're going to be doing and predict that year one, two, and three with continued anti-VEGF injection. All right, thanks. If there are no other questions, I'll, I'll be here if, if anybody else has further questions, so thank you.